All right. My name is John Miller, and I'm here to talk about assessing bipolar disorder, particularly among transgender participants and communities. Quick about me, I'm a post-baccalaureate researcher and project manager with Helping Giveaway Psychological Science, as well as a study coordinator with the Relationship Development Center at Stony Brook University. I'm also a practicing attorney, so let me take a moment to say that this presentation is for educational purposes only. Nothing herein should be taken as legal or medical advice or opinion. With that out of the way, let's get to the roadmap. I'm gonna talk a bit about bipolar misdiagnosis, assessment, and the transgender minority stress issue, discuss how we tested the HCL32R1, one of the more prominent ways to screen for bipolar hypomania, get into the analyses that we performed using item response theory and exploratory factor analysis, and then take a moment to discuss some major takeaways, including things to guide your own research practice going forward. So let's get into it by starting with a long-term problem of bipolar misdiagnosis. Bipolar disorder is frequently misdiagnosed and mistaken for a number of other disorders. With bipolar two, the major threat is being mistaken for major depressive disorder. Because the depressive symptomology of bipolar two are markedly similar to major depressive disorder, it's really hypomania that we're screening for to distinguish the disorder. But that's a bit tricky to do. Hypomania is a less severe form of mania and not always unpleasant to experience. So people suffering from bipolar two may not perceive the hypermania portion as something to report to a physician or a therapist. It might occur to them as a lasting good mood or a particularly pleasant week or month, not the type of thing you go to a doctor for. So they only report the depressive symptoms and those are diagnosed accordingly as often major depressive disorder. And when people get misdiagnosed, they tend to stay misdiagnosed for a good long time. A 2007 study found the average time between first misdiagnosis to correct diagnosis to be about 10 years on average. 11 years later, another study found this average to be about eight years. That's a two year difference across a decade of study and intervention. Not great, not a great improvement. And while this is happening, patient symptoms often worsen while they're incurring the expensive treatment. And it's still a witheringly long time for someone to be medicated for entirely the wrong disorder. And as you might imagine, there are several life impacts along the way. Symptoms remain troublesome and may worsen. Patients experience enormous costs. Some of these are financial, pharmaceuticals are expensive and not everyone's insured. Some are costs to time and some encounter access to care issues. Many young people have healthcare in college and then lose it when they enter the workforce. And there are also second order life impacts. Now, hypomania may not hospitalize you, but you might lose your job or hurt your relationships with friends and family, which are often protective factors against other disorders. So this is a major problem. And for that reason, we need assessments to accurately screen for hypomania and reduce the size of this misdiagnosis length. The problem of bipolar II misdiagnosis led to the creation of the hypomania checklist or HCL32 by Jules Lanx and colleagues out of the University of Zurich in 2005, blending DSM criteria with findings from an earlier qualitative study conducted by the university in 2003. This scale has seen multiple revisions, though the first revision has seen likely the most use and has seen international validation. It consists primarily of 32 questions, which are sorted into two latent subscales, the sunny and the dark. You may have heard of these referred to by other naming conventions, such as happy and snappy or elated and irritated. Uh, Dr. Ongst referred to them as factor one and factor two, so you can choose your own names. Uh, for the sunny scale, which is commonly known as active and elated in the literature, uh, these are symptoms such as being more sociable, more talkative, needing less sleep, uh, getting more work done, feeling more productive. You can imagine why no one's going to a doctor to say, hey, listen, can you get this to stop, please? Now, by comparison, dark or irritable risk taking, you see a lot more things that are experienced as disorder, being easily distracted, getting to more fights, having racing thoughts, and additionally, some substance use, both of things that are legal, like alcohol, and cigarettes, and things that are illegal, like some of the more uh, hard drugs and other substances. So now that we've talked a bit about hypomania, let's talk about the transgender community. Researchers have observed a higher frequency of bipolar diagnosis among the LGBTQIA community, in particular the trans community, or trans-identified community. 
There are several reasons that might be. A predominant explanation is the minority stress model, whereby the heightened frequency of mental health disorder among these groups is explained through the unique stressors experienced by sexual and gender minorities, both internalized and externalized stigma and abuse. I'm going to call your mind back to those bipolar misdiagnosis harms we discussed two slides ago, and I want you to think about them in light of some of the unique challenges facing trans-identified folks. First, just being there's a broad range of gender minorities. We've got transmasculine and transfeminine, but also non-binary. Um, some people might be pre-operation and post-operation or have no interest in transitioning at all. And there's a wealth of gender queer identities amidst them all. These groups all experience the world in different ways and need to be treated differently, not as a monolith. Trans-identified folks also experience proximal and distal stigma and abuse with the added phenomenon of misgendering stress, which has been shown to have major negative effects on mental health. Trans populations also have a frighteningly high youth homelessness rate and a lack of familial support. This means a lack of resources to seek help and secure treatment, as well as a loss of common protective factors against various health challenges. And globally speaking, trans individuals face political persecution of varying intensity, ranging from exclusion to capital punishment. This is true internationally, and this is true domestically. In the United States, we've seen a spate of anti-LGBT laws passed over the last few years, particularly targeting trans individuals, specifically trans youth. So lots of unique challenges, and we'd like to use these assessment tools to help trans-identified folks as best we can to effectively screen for bipolar disorder. But we don't know for sure that our tools work. A study just last year noted measurement invariance for the GAD-7 and the PHQ-9, two of the most used screening tools for anxiety and depression respectively when assessing transgender participants. And we don't know whether our other tools have this invariance issue and whether the tools work as accurately with trans folks or whether they work at all. So that's a big problem. And with that problem established, let's talk about testing the HCL32R1, another important tool. So this was done as part of a project with helping give away psychological science using the open teaching method. This involves secondary analysis of a data set collected by the Depression Bipolar Support Alliance and analyzed with a team of post-baccalaureate researchers who uh, coincidentally have not met in person for most of them laying with the project, mostly communicating via Zoom. This open teaching exercise used our studio Google Workplace Suite and other free resources to try to train the next generation of psychologists to perform research well. Uh, this data set had an N of around 7,800, and we saw an interesting spread of genders, mostly female, but a good amount of male, and we had about 137 or 1.7% of participants identify as trans when, address, when asked the gender. So moving forward with this data set, we wanted to first subject it to item response theory to learn a bit about the item structure and how those items behave. We learned this through Dr. Eric Engstrom's open teaching exercise. And in doing so, we split the scale into its sunny and dark subfactors to preserve the presumption of unidimensionality essential to an item response theory. We further split the data into gender groups, male, female, and trans identified. We used a 0.8 threshold to determine li uh, reliability for the IRT analysis. Uh, by the way, the, uh, the R code for IRT analysis is here. Our code book will be available on OSF with these slides and a copy of the HCL32 and can be accessed with a QR code at the end of the presentation or a hyperlink in the video description. Along the way, we wanted to do a factor analysis as an exploratory exercise. To better understand the data set and give context to what our findings might be, we also want to see if the scale would load the same now as it did for Jules Knox and colleagues back in 2005. Per best practices and prior HCL32 literature, we used a scree plot to identify the number of latent subfactors and used maximum likelihood exploratory factor analysis with a ProMax rotation, observing a 0.4 loading threshold and requiring a loading of more than three items per factor to be viable. Again, in consultation with prior research. So that's the data analysis plan. We hypothesized that since the HCL32 had shown some invariance with respect to gender in prior studies, mostly around particular items, that we would see some amount of invariance with respect to trans-identified participants as well. So let's see what we found. So right off the bat, 
with our reliability curves for the item response theory, we see the sunny groups with the scale mostly reliable in the lower end of the latent factor x-axis between negative two and zero. That's about what you'd expect to see for a screening measure and, and generally ideal. Uh, however, while male and female groups look very similar, we do see the trans curve for the sunny groups is shallower with less information above the reliability threshold. Um, as for the dark subscale, we're not entirely sure what happened there as none of the gender groups show particularly high reliability uh, for any amount of, of the latent variable. But we do see the trans group is, again, behaving differently from both the male and female groups. Moving on to our item information criteria curves, we indicate the sensitivity and discrimination of each item in the measure. This essentially means it's analyzing when I switch from no to yes. And here we once again see uh, mostly similar male and female identified groups with some key differences in the, the trans identified group. I'm going to highlight two items in particular, items 16 and 19, which are sex drive and thinking faster respectively. So for these, we're not seeing this nice discriminatory curve. Uh, we've got a gentle slope with a very high y-intercept that doesn't even actually uh, touch the x-axis. This means these items are not very useful or discriminative for screening hypomania. Um, and with the high y-intercept might actually lead to more false positives when assessing for hypomania with the trans population. These are the obvious standouts, but let's take a couple closer look at some particular items. So here we have item 11, I plan more activities and projects, and item 12, I have more ideas, I am more creative. We're seeing the right shape with the trans group, but a softer curve for the trans identified group. We're not getting the sharp angles that give the item a much sharper and better discriminative ability. These two items also don't appear to be face valid as items you'd expect to be different with transgender groups per se. So this might reflect minority stress, feeling less inclined to plan activities or have being, having your creativity be suppressed by dealing with these different stressors, or it might be some other factor we're unaware of. And let's switch back into our scale for the dark. So once again, we're seeing the trans-identified group has slightly softer curves, particularly item 27, uh, which is being more quarrelsome. Let's highlight that. So the elongated curve on this one makes false negative more likely, which is not what you want from an assessment to screen for low levels of hypomania. For the mathematically inclined, I also want to show off our fit statistic. As you can see, the fit is roughly the same for male and female identified groups and for when we don't split the data by gender at all. They're generally the same and pretty good as far as fit statistics go. But then we get to the trans group and we see the fit statistics deviate from the norm. The fit is weaker in the sunny scale and actually stronger in the dark scale. Regardless, we see the people who identify this way are not experiencing the assessment in quite the same way as people identify as male or female. We're a bit short on time, so I'll move through the EFA results a little quicker. The screen plot found a third factor, which only had two items loading onto that factor, uh, both of them relating to sex drive. This factor had been dropped in prior HCL32 studies, and the two items had been merged into one in prior revisions of the HCL32 scale. So we proceeded with a two-factor solution for our data set. And our factor loadings are more or less similar, some notable absences and inclusions. This is fairly common in HCL32 validations. Many studies have items load slightly differently from 2005 study, especially item 32, which was dropped from the original study due to a data collection error. I will note that the two items with poor discriminative value from the sunny portion of our trans group were among the two factors that did not load in our solution, suggesting there may be a quirk to our data with regard to those factors that we haven't quite deciphered yet. So looking at our results, what should we take away from all of this? Well, first, the data indicates that there is some item and scale invariance between the trans-identified group and the other gender groups that we assessed. For this reason, and again, reminding you that this is not legal or medical advice or opinion, I would advocate caution when using the HCL 32R1 when doing studies with gender minorities. The field of LGBT studies within clinical psychology is small, but it's growing. And 
We see these groups included more frequently in research that historically has excluded them, which means that researchers right now have a lot of power to positively influence the field and make sure that the tools that we use benefit those who need them most and aren't perpetuating past injustices, whether explicitly or implicitly. We should be reviewing all of our tools, not just the HCL32, to ensure that we continue to do good science and build a strong foundation for the studies to follow, particularly in the LGBTQIA community. And this analysis itself is not without its issues. Some of those are attendant to secondary analysis. These data were not collected in a study designed to answer this particular question. That's clearest in the under descriptive breakdown of gender into male, female, and trans, rather than a more fulsome array of identities, which might include non binary, uh, gender queer, or even just the term other. Uh, the gender category should at least have been broken down into trans masculine and trans feminine, not a anomalous third gender. We also acknowledge that this is a non diagnostic data set. There's a lot we can learn with diagnostic data, and we would like to see future studies test the assessment tools with clinical samples. And needless to say, those future studies should use a broader array of genders to better capture the human story behind all these data. And this is not just true of this study, but of all studies. If you're collecting data using only the male female binary, you're missing the story. And if you're controlling for gender using that male female binary, you're not actually controlling for gender in all of its forms. And in doing so, you're doing a disservice to the sexual and gender minority groups who don't experience what you're measuring in the same way and might be perpetuating some of these past harms. So we encourage you to be more thoughtful um, in, in this and any other study that you might conduct. But as we reach our conclusion, I'd like to thank you for your time and thank the entire research team that worked on the study. I hope you have found this interesting and that you consider some of our takeaways when designing your own studies in the future. You can find our materials, including these slides at the QR code here. I've been John Miller and thank you for your time.